I think I think let's start as more and more people join in. We can start in the meantime. So uh, I formally welcome Tanya uh, to this talk show. Uh, thanks, Tanya, for taking out time in the first week of January, the first week of the year. We know that first week is always very hectic uh, once you come uh, from holiday. And uh, uh, I welcome everyone. Uh, on the profit group investment talk, which we do uh, very often, maybe a couple of, couple of times in a month. And let me first introduce uh, Tanya. So she founded her capital with the mission to empower women to become financially independent and to take control of her income. Her capital is a 15 million seed fund in Singapore investing only female founded scalable businesses and that is across Southeast Asia. Uh, and, I, and I know why this is so important because uh, if we want to really empower women, we need to have more women in the executive and in the leadership role globally, not only a part of the world, but globally. And a very recent McKinsey report suggested that with women at the top, there are the, the, the likelihood of a company becoming profitable and scaling and uh, going long is, is, is more than 25 percent vis a vis when a company is led by a man. Even then, only 18 percent of firms globally are led by women. And even if you talk about OECD countries, that's only 22 percent. So, the, and, and I think that's, that's very. Uh, uh, disturbing and surprising considering the role which women play otherwise globally and in, in, our, in our personal and family life. And that's where Tanya is playing such an important role globally in terms of helping women to raise capital, uh, to empower them to become entrepreneurs. And with this, I uh, request Tanya to give a brief intro about what she's trying to do and her background in terms of uh, how she's uh, helping women. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, great to be here this afternoon. I'm based in Singapore and launching her capital here with my business partner who is a Singaporean and I am from originally from London and have been in Singapore for approximately four years. When I first arrived into Singapore from the UK, I had a background um, of working in um, uh, international law firms in the UK and in Australia. And when I arrived in Singapore, I wanted to um, move towards supporting female founders and, 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 and gender equality um, generally. I first got interested in this as a, as a topic, not just because I'm a woman, but uh, when I was working in one particular law firm in London, I ran a project on um, where all the women went uh, because um, you will see a, a sort of um, equal amount of female lawyers at the junior level and, and, and not at the senior level. So where were all the lawyers going? So I ran a project um, to understand what was happening um, with female career. Um, and the findings of that really um, shocked me and stuck with me. So when I came to Singapore and started to make personal investments, I realized very quickly there was some serious inequality when it comes to venture capital. And so I teamed up with my business partner, Gail Wong, who was also a big advocate for um, financial empowerment for females. She comes from an investment banking background. Uh, she did over 10 years on Wall Street um, at Morgan Stanley. And the two of us um, seemed to make the perfect partnership. Gail was Singaporean and I was European. Um, Gail was great at the, um, uh, the detail and the due diligence and, um, and very methodical in her thinking. And I really enjoyed the relationships and, and building out our um, presence and, and making connections. So the writing was on the wall for us and, and we made uh, we came together and grew a team of around 40 self-funded female investors. And we invested into 
uh, female founders across Southeast Asia, uh, sector agnostically and intentionally so. And following that, we decided to launch as the institutionalized fund and that we are today. So we launched last year in the middle of this damn pandemic. pandemic and um, it's been somewhat challenging, but um, seeing uh, a lot of great female talent in Asia. And uh, we are, as, as you pointed out, at a very early stage fund for female entrepreneurs looking to back um, women, particularly those in um, uh, consumer tech, consumer, uh, we do some social impact investing, and we also invest into um, sort of general tech, I guess you could call it, education technology, HR tech, legal tech, and fintech. And, um, and, and, and we have a sort of special interest in female health as well, because it's a huge um, under, under-researched, underserved um, space. Women make up 51% of the population, so there's no reason why that should be the case. Um, we are the majority after all. Um, so yes, that's why we exist. Do you, do you, would you like any more detail about her capital? Or? I think uh, uh, that's fine. We will, we will uh, talk about that specifically uh, because I have more queries which, which I'll ask you later. But uh, Tanya, uh, uh, why, why Asia and why Singapore? I think you, uh, you were in London and you moved to Singapore. Uh, why Singapore and why Southeast Asia? Uh, so I moved here for personal reasons. Okay. Uh, that, that's what originally brought, brought, me to, brought me to Singapore. However, I'll be honest with you, um, I was largely driven by the weather um, because UK weather's terrible and I wanted slightly better weather. I say that and I'm sat here in Singapore in the pouring rain um, day after day because it's rainy season right now, but it was largely the weather um, amongst other things. And in terms of Singapore for the business, Singapore makes absolute sense for, for her capital because it is um, you know, a huge financial hub for Asia. It attracts so much of the great female entrepreneurial talent from the region um, based themselves here. So although we're based here, uh, we're, we're, we are uh, much broader than Singapore. You know, we see, it, for, for every five companies we see in Singapore, you know, um, most likely three are not founded by Singapore. Um, yeah. So it's, it's just a, a natural hub, financial hub and, and ecosystem in the, you know, for startups as well. So it's a great place for us to be. Outside of COVID, it's great geographically for traveling around um, and visiting portfolio companies you know, in Indonesia and um, uh, you know, Thailand and, and Vietnam. Yeah. So um, fantastic location. We also focus a, um, a little bit on Australia, so very close to Australia. Um, the only area we're not close to in Singapore, but we wouldn't be close in any part of Asia, um, would be to the US. And we do some female health investing in, in the US. So um, yes, but uh, we, you know, COVID's preventing any of that travel anyway, so. Yeah, 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 COVID is, is uh, prevented complete travel for all of us. So any uh, any interest which you have in India, uh, are you looking to invest in Indian companies also uh, led by women or, or you are focusing as of now only in Australia and uh, other parts of, uh, and Singapore and other parts of Southeast Asia? So, so for fund, we're on fund one and fund one, we are purely Southeast Asia focused um, okay. with, with the carve outs in those, so Hong Kong, um australia and and some in the us and it's really based on deal flow what we and what we've seen um and where the where we're seeing deals coming through to us um that said in i would say in the last five months or so i've received an awful lot of connections in india uh, both from founders from investors um and, and we completely appreciate that it is a huge market. That said, as a Singaporean and a, as a Brit, uh, I'm not sure, and we, we don't currently have any Indian females in our team, um, I don't feel that we're necessarily equipped right now to take India by storm. Oh, okay. <laughs> 
So maybe maybe we can provide you something for us too. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So uh, that's that's great. And let's talk about your investment. So you said that you have already packed around 40 entrepreneurs to relate. So what what has been your investment thesis in the sense that uh, at, at what stage? I know you are very early stage uh, investor, but at what stage do you do you invest at, at, at the idea stage or do you want some traction and the MVP to be to be ready to really invest in? Um, sorry, I'm not sure if it's my sound or your sound, but I'm having a little difficulty to understand. I, I think you asked what stage we invest in, and the stage we are investing in is um, we do anything from pre-seed, so very small tickets. So we will go in. Um, very, very early days, even with a ticket of 10,000 US dollars, for example, with the view to very quickly sweep in and, and, and offer more capital. Typically, we come in at um, seed stage, so slightly later than that. So um, typically, we're coming in um, around the $200,000 mark. Um, we go up to Series A, uh, which, which would take us up to around 2.5 million US dollars. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, I was trying to resolve if there is any sound from my side. And uh, uh, and do you also do a follow-up investments? Uh, so, uh, what has been your uh, thought process in terms of follow-up investment? Because I have spoken to so many investors, and, and they say that we want to back our startup to a point where they are at a Series A level. So, do you do that, or, or uh, what, what other things you, you do in terms of helping women entrepreneurs other than just the fundraise? Okay, so yes, we definitely do um, follow on funding. And, and if anybody is familiar with the data for female founders, um, which I could talk to you about until about Tuesday of next week, um, female founders find it, um, statistically speaking, it gets harder and harder for females to raise capital as they as they maneuver through the funding rounds um, and the the very small percentage uh, of the, of um, of venture capital funding for females gets smaller and smaller. So it's very important to us to not just seed um, female founders and then send them on their merry way and fingers crossed and hope the best. Um, so what we try to do is a pre-seed investment, a seed investment, and then potentially a Series A investment. Um, most likely a co-investor. Um, co uh, you know, we wouldn't lead the round on the Series A, but that's sort of where we're at at the moment um, with what we're investing in. Um, there was another part to your question. Sorry. I'm saying in terms of, of what, what exactly you do in terms of helping women entrepreneurs, yes. women would need more help in terms of connect, in terms of uh, hiring the right right people. So, yep. uh, yeah. So I okay. wanted you to, yeah. Sure. So, so it, before, we, before Gail and I um, ran her capital, we ran uh, an angel network that I talked about earlier called um, uh, Ladies Investment Club or LIC. Um, and that club was put together purely based on we were we were financially independent women coming together who wanted to offer more than just capital. And we find this with female investors generally. They do not want to throw their money at a financial advisor or, or, or any type of investment and just walk away and hope for the best. Um, typically, female investors want to have... Um, have some kind of impact and influence over what their money is doing. And so we at Her Capital offer that um, to our LPs. So people that are investing into Her Capital have the opportunity where skills are aligned to support um, our portfolio companies. So one of the things we learned through the Ladies Investment Club is that women really care very deeply about how they can support founders. So we had 40 women in our angel network and each and every one of them brought something to the table to offer our portfolio companies. So whether that was, they come from a very senior role and you know, in a, uh, in a senior marketing role, sales, um, financial um, CFOs, 
we had lawyers and we had doctors and we had we literally tried to tick off you know all, all the business areas all the industry sectors so that when we were investing into companies we were able to sort of pull together a team that was able to support and advise the founder so that was very much the ethos of ladies investment club and we're following that through into her capital um, however just to caveat that we are not investing into women who need um, handholding. We're investing into women who are, you know, experts in their sector, experts at uh, uh, whatever they're doing, and and exceptional at and outstanding at execution. We are not expecting to provide handholding and advice on their color schemes, etc. Women, and I think this is um, often um, a misconception, is that is that women need extra education. Women need extra help, extra mentoring, extra, and, and, and often that isn't the case. And we speak to a number of institutions and, and the other VCs, and they're always offering extra help to women, you know. And, and yes, it's very true that um, we, we do tend to um, get very far from our networks. And so if you think about most venture capitalists are men, it's no surprise, therefore, that most of the people they invest into are people within their networks are also men. So there is definitely a gap when it comes to networks. So introductions and sharing of our connections um, is definitely something we facilitate at Hack Capital and a huge. I think, I think, that, I think that's that's what I was referring to because yeah. uh, it's very difficult for them to get into the first break, uh, to first conversation, get into the discussion with investors. As you rightly said, most of the VC firms globally are being led by men yeah. and that's where that's where you are creating a lot of value in this. Tanya, uh, in terms of investment, so what is your methodology to, to choose a startup? Uh, uh, what is the process? So, can, so do you run a, 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 a class kind of thing where people can, so for a particular class people can uh, can apply and then, then you, you choose or it's it's more of a ad hoc basis when anyone who want to raise capital during the year can can approach your fund what's the methodology so so we don't have sort of windows where we accept decks etc we're not um i would say we're not that um probably not that sophisticated but also not that um advanced in our in our thinking yet um we we receive decks all you know all day every day i probably get five or six a day um, come in and my business partner probably gets more because she she actually leads our deal, um, our investments and I take the charge of our fundraise. So, um, so yes, we, we get quite a few debts um, coming in. We, of course, we have special interests that I mentioned to you about what you know, really floats our boat and, and what we're really interested in investing in and, and the teams, uh, you know, has very in-depth knowledge in some of those areas that they talked about. Um, so for, for us, um, the, obviously, the uh, when, we, when it comes to selecting an investment, there's many, many different, um, it's, it's very multifaceted. Um, there isn't sort of one, um, one thing we're looking at or criteria. So aside from the um, addressable market and you know you know the uh, the traction to date and whether we believe that there's um, that this business is plugging a, a real need and, and a gap, um, what one of the things that I really place a lot of importance upon and the reason for that is that I've had great experience in doing this. When I have a really good feeling about the founder and I can see that this founder is someone that I like and I want to work with. And I can see them growing a team and retaining a team. And they've got this passion and flair um, for entrepreneurship and for what they're doing. And that goes a very long way in my book um, for, for me because we, we tend to invest very early on. So it's extremely hard to you know, analyze a, a proposition based purely on numbers. Um, a large part of it for me is is about the founder. Uh, you rightly said because at the initial stage, uh, you don't have a lot of data about the business, and uh, it's it's what we we back the founder because 
business models may can change, but founders if they hang in. That's what we need. So we need founders who are able to build team, who are able to understand and and take it. Uh, in, in terms of uh, other points, of what so I would really want you to talk about a few of your portfolio companies uh, uh, in terms of uh, interesting startups that, that you are you have been connected with, you have invested in Southeast Asia, which they are doing very well. Get success stories. Uh, that that will really help and inspire many other women, not only in Southeast Asia and in world, but also in India. Sorry, Alok, what was the beginning of that question? Just the beginning part. I'm saying the, uh, I, I would want you to share some of the interesting success stories of founders or investments Fine. which you have done. Yeah. Yep. Sure. Um, so probably one of the um, most exciting businesses that we've got at the moment and I'm most excited about. Um, actually, I have, I have a couple, but let me start with, with um, Tech Assembly, which is um, based here in Singapore. And it, we, we came in and invested um, in their former business, which was Gibbs Less Ordinary. And they, it, was a, um, it was an e-commerce platform, a marketplace. And the technology that was available to them um, through um, technology providers was insufficient. So we funded the development of their own technology. And what we ended up with uh, was a product, not only that could be used by the marketplace itself, but obviously a product in itself that could be sold as a SaaS solution. And, um, and that business has spun off and is most is most exciting. And I met with the founder only yesterday, actually. Um, and we meet semi-regularly to talk about what's happening, where it's going. And I came away from that conversation yesterday super excited. Um, I think they've done fantastically well, a real success story of COVID. So essentially it's um, technology for, you know, marketplaces, um, uh, can use uh, by the you know uh, subscribe to the the service and you know through because of COVID and and the digitalization of, of everything last year um, they really had a great 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 year um, so I'm very excited about that business so talking they're talking to some fantastic big names in the US and in Europe um, as well as here in Asia but really really excited for that. Um, and the other success story I would talk about um, is, um, is a few companies we have based in New York. And um, so a little off, um, off our usual sort of geography, but um, they are all in the space of, we have three actually in New York that are all in the space of um, uh, sexual wellness and, and female, um, female wellness generally. And ex again, ex great success stories of, um, of our portfolio um, during 2020. And, um, and I think COVID has really advanced things um, and people's thinking. Uh, and, and perhaps it's because people took a lot of time last year to um, really reconnect um, with themselves and their partners. And I think it's, a, it's been a, a great, um, catalyst for those businesses. Yep, you rightly said that uh, even though we cannot say that uh, COVID has been good for everyone, but it has accelerated the technology adoption by a decade, if not by two. Even in India, I can see a lot of uh, MSME, SMEs adopting technology, getting most of the processes auto automized. So I think uh, you rightly said that, and uh, that's happening in India also. Uh, in, in terms of uh, COVID, so uh, what in terms of technology, one, one is technology where we have seen that technology has really been, uh, the adoption has been accelerated, but what are other changes which you see uh, with which, which uh, COVID has uh, has played positively on overall on the, on the startup and entrepreneurial ecosystem globally and more so in Southeast Asia? Do you see any change in terms of the mindset in COVID times prior to uh, in 2019 and prior to COVID, and what what 
in, in terms of business models, in terms of uh, how the business needs to be accelerated and scaled, uh, bit scaling is, is something which are, are you still seeing a change in the mindset, not only in the entrepreneurs, but also in, in investors' mindset? Um, so that's a little hard for me to answer because um, we only launched during COVID. So um, it's hard for me to compare pre-COVID um, when it comes to venture capital um, investing um, versus now or, or during COVID. Um, but um, I'm seeing, I, I, I think that the answer is most likely a lot of changes, um, but it's, it's pretty tricky for me to give you a, um, I, I can hypothesize on that. Um, but I think I wouldn't be able to um, give you a full um, credible answer, I'm afraid. Okay, so my mind, I think what uh, what has changed, Tanya, because uh, uh, one is in terms of the investors are very uh, focused on profitability and business and unit economics. And they believe that just uh, burning money into marketing and ads to sign in uh, more customers and users might not be the right uh, uh, way to move forward because at the end of the day, we need to build a scalable business which can survive uh, all, all the weather. I think that's that's one thing which is changing, which, uh, which I feel. Second is in terms of uh, earlier, a lot of businesses were getting invested at the idea stage. Uh, and and I, at the idea stage, the people were ready to invest even uh, and institutional investors, I've seen they're ready to invest only on the idea and only on the, what they can do with, with that idea. I think now it's getting very, very difficult for someone to raise capital at idea stage. So I think MVP interaction and talking to uh, customers trying to understand that whether this, this business model can generate positive cash flow, because positive cash flow is something which has become very paramount now, which, which to my mind, prior to COVID, investors were looking flexible on that. So I think that one change has happened, which I see very regularly now. Uh, investors, the, they are not even willing to talk to uh, most of the investors if, if they think that it's, it's just pre-revenue and they don't have the MVP. I think, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think I, I, I think that's probably true. Um, however, I do know I do know a number of investors, much like us at Her Capital, we are um, definitely focused on on very early stage. And I know a number of um, VCs that have that as a strategy. Um, the other thing that I would say is, you said that um, that investors are focused very much on profitability. The, the other angle, though, to think about is that before COVID, I think that when we talked about um, social impact or diverse managers, or and, and these were all very much a hard sell. And 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 don't get me wrong, it's still um, sometimes misunderstood. So often people misunderstand what my fund is about. Um, that her capital is about because they see that we're investing into female founders. And so sometimes they immediately assume that that means that we are a not-for-profit or, um, you know, we're some kind of charitable giving um, or, you know, we're just not going to make a lot of money. Our fund is very much for profit and we're investing in businesses that are for profit. However, that said, hyper growth and unicorn hunting is not, for me, the way forward. And it's not what we're searching for at Her Capital. There are a ton of amazing female founders that are building businesses that are moderate growth, sustainable profitability, and doing a great job. Will they ever IPO? No. But do they need to? Not necessarily. Probably not. And we're very happy to back businesses like that especially as we see a huge opportunity because traditional venture is not backing businesses like that. So it's a great opportunity for us um, to have access to amazing founders, great businesses, 
um, just they look a little different. I think that's thanks for building that point, uh, Tanya, because we need people like you who understand that all business cannot be uniform, all business cannot go IPO, and there are different gestation periods for different business and different yeah. entrepreneurs. And, and I was about to ask you that when, when you invest, what do you use exit time? But now I think you have answered in a very different way. And, and it seems that, and I think we, we need a fund and investors like you to create a balance between bid scaling, wherein people just burn, 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 and then they realize after five years that they either uh, sell it out, uh, break it down the, uh, the, the valuation. And I think valuation game is something which, which is overplayed globally. And I think we really need investors like you, the ecosystem, to understand that valuation is just a number. At the end of the day, the business needs to be scalable and business needs to be needs to survive and, and create value, not only for investors, but also for all the stakeholders, which includes entrepreneurs and which includes the, the, the society and the ecosystem around that business. I think point very well taken. Uh, Nitya Prashad wants to ask in terms of how uh, they can connect with you. Uh, is, is LinkedIn or website is, is the best way to do that uh, if, if they require, if they want to send their tech? I'm just typing my email into the chat right now. Oh, it's. Um... There we go. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Any, I, I'm, I'm extremely active on LinkedIn. Um, so I encourage everyone to link in with me and that keeps you abreast of what's happening at Her Capital. I've just shared my email with everybody. I'm very happy to receive decks or questions and help wherever we can. That's, that's great. And I think uh, we will take another question where Maria is saying that how could you break it down about what you look in a female founder when you're deciding to invest? Uh, are, you look, are you looking at institution or you look at other, other thought processes and, and other features that in terms of what exactly is the X factor? I think you, you, you answered that in a different way, but if you want to take it up this question. Yeah. So I, I, I liken this to, um, picking a boyfriend or a husband um, and a partner, should I say, is it isn't always, um, you're not always able to accurately articulate what it is. It's, it's some, it, you know, there are obvious things. So for a founder, you know, um, we, we're looking, yes, out, absolutely outstanding execution. That is very, very important. Um, if we're talking just about the founder rather than the business, which I think is what we're talking about here. So yeah, absolutely outstanding execution. And that might be that they've had a startup before, hasn't always been successful, but um, I think actually statistically speaking, a founder that's had a failed startup previously is more likely to succeed the second time than a first time founder. So, um, so yes, absolutely outstanding execution. Um, you know, diligence and um, and all of those obvious um, points that that we're we're looking for and, and and knowing their business. Right, someone the founders that we've backed have always been founders that have known everything. You know, and 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 they make it their business to know everything because we've come across some amazing female founders in the past, and then. And this is not a reflection on women. This is a reflection on just founders. But you know, you ask them a question, let's say about the finances of the business, um, and they 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 fall down. I don't know the numbers very well. Um, you've got to know the numbers. You've got to know, you know, um, and appreciate. You've got to have the right people in your team. So you haven't got to be an expert in in all these areas. Um, and that's why we have, you know, bigger teams, a CFO and a CTO, and um, but. Um, you've got to make it your business to know, you know, you can't run a business successfully and not understand the numbers of your business. Um, however, characteristics um, of founders. So I, I think I touched on this earlier, but very much for me, it is about likability and my, my belief in them to um, uh, attract and maintain and grow a very strong 
leadership team for that business. Because when you're running a startup, um, you're often not paying, especially at the stage we're investing in, you're often not paying, you know, market rate, top rates to your employees. So really people are there because they believe in the business and they believe in you as the founder. So it's very important to me that that founder demonstrates and, and can, can show that they have the skills to um, maintain, um, attract and retain and grow an amazing team. Um, and do I want to sit on a call with them every week? You know, because I call them up, you know, yesterday I had an hour long coffee with one of my founders. If, if she was a nightmare, <laughs> I would be like, oh, this is terrible, but she's awesome. Um, and so do I want to do that with you? Um, do I want to jump into that bed with you and spend all this time, you know, talking and dissecting and helping? And um, and with, with the founder that I met yesterday, I've been to Hong Kong with her multiple times for pitches um, and, and business weekends. I've given, I've flown to Hong Kong on my birthday before for her for an event, um, you know, and, and that's because I really like her. I really respect her. And I want to be part of that team. Uh, thanks, thanks for your views. Uh, and you rightly said that uh, it's it's like choosing your boyfriend or your husband when when, when you are really investing at an initial stage because we are uh, choosing the founder and not the business uh, at, at most of the times at the initial stage. Uh, reason being that we don't have enough data to prove the business. We don't know whether other investors will come in and invest. So it's it's like we are choosing someone in dark, and that's what we do when we choose our, our boyfriend or our husband. And 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 I think uh, and that also makes life more difficult for for investors who are investing at the initial stage because they need to focus on 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 the on the main part, and which is which is the founder. I think uh, with this, I, I'm done. I don't have any questions, Tanya. And uh, you have already shared your uh, email, so many people will, uh, will get in touch with you. We are all already live on Facebook. And again, I, I would thank you for taking our time in the first week of uh, New Year. I know it's always crazy in the first week. And also in terms of sharing your views, sharing your thought process, sharing your thesis, and also your vision and objectivities in terms of what you want to do with this fund. And I wish you all the best because I can understand and I can feel that you are doing something which is so important uh, when women are 51% are of the population, they should at least uh, and, and be more women in the leadership and we want to see more women as entrepreneurs and more women who are able to raise capital who are, able, who are part of the leadership team. So I think that's a great cause which you are uh, which, which you are actually helping and, 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 and trying to help more women. And uh, uh, I, I, will, I will love to get in uh, touch with you. And if, if I'm traveling to Singapore, and I, I hope I will to do soon, I will get in touch with you. And uh, let's see how we can work together because I see a lot of synergy in this. And I hope, and I again wish you all the best for your fun and, and your vision, which is great. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. And thank you everyone for joining. Thanks. Thanks, Tanya. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, bye.